part of the deal if I'm your advisor uh, is that you have to agree to babysit. <laughs> And uh, I appreciate your um, patience in allowing me to um, arrive a little bit late uh, and bring my son, Stayadi and Amaru. Um, in our tradition, I come from the Opata people, uh, which connects me to the Mexicayo and the Mayan traditions. Um, and in our traditions, um, we bring our children everywhere, and we are unashamed to do that. Um, and you have to say that in the society. Uh, one that constantly disinvests in children uh, and in parents that are investing in their children. Um, so um, I appreciate uh, the latitude, uh, both from my colleagues uh, and from the community, uh, to be able to bring my sons um, so that this experience is also normalized in their life, that people from our community graduate from universities and people from our community uh, get doctorate degrees. So the words uh, that I composed um, today are um, primarily for you all, the graduates. Um, so I went the wrong direction because you all are already graduates. <laughs> um, so I, I begin um, in another one of our traditions, um, which is uh, to ask permission to share palabra with, with any group um, when you are on someone else's land. Um, so I acknowledge that we are on indigenous land despite what um, the regions of San Francisco State uh, and the CSU system, I believe. Um, I acknowledge that we're on indigenous land. In order to share palabra on indigenous land, you have to ask permission from the people whose land you're on. So I ask permission from the ancestors on this land to share some words with you today. And then I want to thank um, the parents and the families and the community members um, for attending on this day of celebration. It's an honor to share words with you um, and with you, the graduates, uh, that are now joining uh, all of us as our colleagues uh, in the world of um, research and practice and education. So let me begin first by congratulating you on your accomplishments, because what you've accomplished matters. It matters to you, it matters to your family, it matters to our communities. But the question that you really should be wrestling with at this point is why does it matter? It matters because you have access, accessed some modicum of institutional power in a society that rarely affords that to people committed to social justice. I will not spend any more of my time today congratulating you on that fact. Society will take care of that. Instead, I will use my time here to bring a sobering message that will temporarily move us from congratulation to challenge. Two years after his death in 1996, Tupac Amaru Shakur's greatest hits album was released. There were four previously unreleased songs on that album, one of which is a song called Unconditional Love. In this song, Tupac, Tupac borrows from a speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave in 1957 in Alabama. In King's speech, he says that there are three types of love, eros, philia, and agape. The first type of love is eros. Eros is a love of the aesthetic, that is, a love of something physical about a person or a thing. It is a love based on your physical attraction as someone like, ooh, she's hella fine, or he's hella fine, and I love them. <laughs> the second kind of love that King talked about was philia. That is, the love you have for your deepest and closest homies. That love is a kind of reciprocal love. In other words, you've got their back because they've got your back. You love on this level because you are loved. The third type of love that King talks about is what he calls agape. And agape is more than eros, agape is more than philia. Agape is the unconditional love that Tupac was talking about. It is the love that seeks nothing in return. It is the love you have for the people that raised you. The love you have for your God, your creator, if you are a churchgoer or a believer in a higher power. It is the love you have for your familia, it is the love I have for you, even those of you that I have never met before. Agape is a love that is based solely on my love for you as human beings, with the infinite potential to change the world. That is agape. That is unconditional love. I was born in Los Angeles and moved several times during my childhood, never really feeling at home anywhere until I got to my current home in East Oakland, where I've lived for over 25 years now. 
Oakland got its name from the vast forests of oak trees that once covered the land in our community. Among all the species of trees in the world, oak trees have some of the deepest root systems. This is one of the reasons that oak trees are so solid, even in the most destructive storms. But our school system, including this one, are not committed to growing graduates that are those kinds of oak trees. They are more interested in growing trees that are pleasing to the eye, trees that look good above the ground with their strong branches and pretty foliage. So they emphasize things like GPAs, war scores, and research projects that virtually no one outside of academia will ever read or be much impacted by. Things that can easily be displayed in their boardrooms on bar graphs and pie charts that supposedly show how much progress we are making. These kinds of trees are premature in their growth, for despite their beauty and apparent strength above the earth, they are masking the shallow roots that lie underneath. To make sure our roots remain shallow, they give us definitions of success that did not come from our ancestors that walked in those forests of trees with deep roots. They tell us that successful people graduate and get out or move up. Sometimes they even call it escaping. That is what they told me when I was growing up. They told me, you're different. They told me, you can use education to get out of here, to escape. But I never wanted schools to teach me how to escape my hood or my hip thing. I wanted schools to teach me about the best of our traditions and histories so that we might restore those for our children. I never wanted school to teach me how to escape poverty. I wanted school to teach me how to end it. The words I share with you today emanate from an unconditional love for my community. My family lives in the 3400 block of East Oakland. We understand the desire to create these exit opportunities. Life in hoods like ours or any hood can be trying at times. The, the more privilege we have, whether that be education or money or both, the more likely we are to feel like we no longer have to put up with the drama in our hoods and that we should just leave for a better life. These hopes for a better and safer life are the same hopes that my parents had for each of my six brothers and sisters. I understand it and I respect it. I also want to change it. To those of you in this graduating class that have similar plans to escape the nation's most wounded communities, some of you already have. Don't do it. We need you. Our nation would be stronger and closer to the promise of a pluralistic multiracial democracy if more doctoral graduates saw our most, value, our most vulnerable communities as places they wanted to help build. I remind you that our doctoral graduating classes would actually reflect the makeup of our state and Bay Area if more people had come back to support them. I also remind you that if you don't speak up for the young people behind you, they may never be able to speak up for you. Do not lose sight of the fact that your time of need is just on the horizon, when you will need those that this society has forsaken. To speak up, to stand up, especially for him that no one else will stand up for, that's unconditional love. That's the teachings of our ancestors. That's the deep-rooted forest of oak trees that when the storm comes will provide safety and shelter to those that need it the most. To be sure, this is not the first commencement speech that has made promises about the unlimited potential of a graduating class to go out and change the world. So why hasn't the world changed? Why did the gunshots and the ghetto birds persist in our neighborhoods? Why did corporate elites and their research lackeys continue to poison our soil, water, and air and deepen their commitment to predatory economic policies that ensure our state of social apartheid? Why do our hip they murder each other over pursuits that produce more funerals than freedom? Why isn't there outrage about the fact that close to 50% of students in high poverty communities never graduate from high school? These are some of the worst kept secrets in our society. The chaos of our communities is so commonplace that it isn't even, it isn't even news anymore. In fact, it is so predictable that networks schedule television shows and breaking news around it. This pimping of the suffering of this country's most forgotten people has been going on for years and there is no national or moral outrage about it. There is no war on poverty. There is no war on the miseducation, undereducation, and no education of the poor. Why? If it were truly something that we didn't expect to happen, something that we didn't want to happen, then there would be a national commitment to stopping it from happening. But there is not. Not right now. This is why I agreed to come and talk to you today. This country has the highest rate of incarceration in the entire world. These imprisoned bodies are overwhelmingly coming from communities that experience the most social, political, and economic disinvestment. They are also frequently the sites of data mining to produce doctoral dissertations. 
If we are going to stop this crisis, we have got to start loving those places and the people in it. That's how we heal it. How much longer can we forsake entire communities before we are also forsaken? How much longer can we inject our veins with what Martin Luther King Jr. called the tranquilizing drug of gradualism? Waiting, waiting, waiting. How much longer can we ignore Emiliano Zapata's words that it is better to die fighting on our feet than to live on our knees? Let me borrow again from our ancestor Tupac Amaru Shakur. He wrote, they ask us why we mutilate each other like we do and wonder why we hold such little worth for human life facing all this drama. But to ask us why we turn from bad to worse is to ignore from which we came. You see, you wouldn't ask why the rose that grew from the concrete had damaged petals. On the contrary, we would all celebrate its tenacity. We would all love its will to reach the sun. Well, we are the roses. This is the concrete. And these are my damaged petals. Don't ask me why. Thank God. Ask me how. I have damaged petals. I wear them in ink on my arms so that every morning when I get out the shower, I'm reminded of who I am, where I came from, and who my ancestors are. These are the roots that hold me up in the storm. But schools told me that that ink was my problem. Schools told me that if I could just leave that ink at the door, that I would be so much more teachable and I would be worth so much more. But you see, the problem with the ink on our arms is that you can't take it off. It is our ink that makes us the oak trees that grow from concrete. And I am here today because I believe in your tenacity and your will to reach the sun. I am also here to tell you that underneath all that concrete I have been describing, there are more beautiful oak trees that need your help to reach the sun. They are your brothers, your sisters, your cousins. They are my sons. They are that young homie sitting in this crowd today wondering if one day she'll get to sit where you are sitting. We need you. They need you. It is clear that we cannot expect much help from those outside of our communities to make this happen. If you, our best and our brightest, our oak trees with the strongest roots, will not love our home enough to change it, why would anyone else? People created these circumstances. People will change them. Which people? Us. No one else. Us. Real warriors are the ones that stand up for their community, not the ones that run away from it, and not the ones that tear it down. I'm talking about warrior scholars that are willing to stand up and fight with their minds, hearts, sweat, and tears for justice for every baby that is born. I believe in the power of people to change communities. I've seen it with my own eyes. Don't buy the dream of escaping that they will be selling you. Don't turn a blind eye to the suffering that you know exists in our communities. Do not define your success by how far away from these problems you can get. Do not attempt to replicate the Disneyland sensibilities and the Peter Pan mentality of the rich in the United States. The mentality that if you are successful enough, if you make enough money, then you never have to grow up. I'm gonna end here where I began by reminding you of the teachings of our ancestors, the indigenous people of this land. The Cherokee Nation has a story that they tell about a little boy who's in his front yard playing. And he comes running into the house and he runs up to his abuelita and he says, Abuelita, I feel like there's a war going on inside my head. And she says, there is me for He says, who's fighting, abuelita? And she says, the two wolves. He says, who are the two wolves, abuelita? And she says, one wolf is rage, greed, avarice, selfishness, violence. He says, who's the other wolf, abuelita? And she says, the other wolf is cariño, familia, community, love, empathy. He says, who wins, abuelita? And she says, the one you feed. Those two wolves are inside of every one of us. Remember the responsibility that comes with graduating from a program specifically designed to develop educational leaders prepared and committed to addressing the radicalized inequity that plagues our democracy. We'll be here waiting. Gracias a todos. Suerte.